I don't need to tell anyone in this room that the brutality and prevalence of CRSV has not subsided. It is a scourge on humanity, affecting a diverse range of individuals and communities across countries and conflict situations in every region of the world. This symposium provides space for strategic reflection to take stock of what we know and what is missing from research, policy, and practice. Our singular focus must therefore be to bridge the gap between resolutions and realities, between our highest aspirations and operations on the ground. This is the second Missing Peace Global Symposium. The first was held 10 years ago in 2013. At the time, many people viewed conflict-related sexual violence as something that was terrible, but it couldn't be stopped. The people who launched the Missing Peace Initiative wanted to change this view. I think in the last 10 years, there's been really something of a data and methods revolution uh, in the study of conflict-related sexual violence. We have, I think, started to think as a kind of community of scholars and practitioners very creatively about how to overcome some of the major challenges that previous generations of scholars have confronted. One of the most important findings, I think, in terms of research is the fact that uh, rape, sec conflict-related sexual violence is not an inevitable byproduct of war. Uh, and research has shown that, that uh, even within the same conflict situation, um, you might have groups that will resort to conflict-related sexual violence and others who do not. The only way to stop uh, the sexual violence in conflict or to end this sexual violence in conflict uh, is bringing justice for the cases that has occurred and that has been occurring and holding perpetrators to account is, is the only way we see um, preventions or deterrence of the, the, the crimes. We know that ultimately national systems are going to be the engines of justice. International courts capture our imagination. We love to establish them, we love to see them operating, but ultimately they can only take a handful of cases. So we need to find ways to empower national systems to take these cases. What is really heartening is that in the last, say, 15 years, we've seen actually a bit of a, almost a renaissance of, of cases. And a lot of these are arising actually in the national courts. We have other mechanisms that have arisen, right, in the last half decade. So I guess in short, we, we have a long trajectory in the course of the century where we've had ebbs and flows and how we've prosecuted and investigated these crimes. And it's never, never been sufficient. But I think we're making progress. So gender responsiveness in transitional justice has three components. The first is that transitional justice should um, address the full range of rights violations that have affected women and girls, but also men and boys from a gender perspective. The second component is that women and girls and LGBTIQ plus people should play a meaningful role as participants in transitional justice processes. And the third component is aiming for social transformation. UNHCR has recognized that gender-based violence and violence in the context of conflict and displacement is a huge problem. And so we don't need to wait for disclosure. We don't need to wait for evidence. We need to assume it's occurring and prepare uh, for response. A lot has changed, I would say, in the past 10 years uh, in the sense that children born of war that is, children conceived through conflict-related sexual violence, are now much more visible um, in public space than they were 10 years ago. And that, I think, has to do with some extremely courageous individuals who have taken up space to kind of say, here I am in the world and I exist. I think that it's well known in this moment that we were completely invisible category of the world. First step, the most important that we took, it's uh, social, socially 
raising awareness about this topic, uh, stopping the stigmatization and discrimination because it's generally public opinion or social opinion is that we are children of enemies. And yeah, I think that is really important to understand that we are just human beings, normal human beings. I think this field um, of conflict-related sexual violence has been has evolved a bit around slowly acknowledging that men were survivors, acknowledging that men needed to be part of accountability, but not just the conversation about perpetrators, as important as that is. Being disabled in a country like Haiti, I've faced different physical and social barriers. The fact that this issue is being openly discussed and addressed shows progress and a growing recognition of the unique challenges faced by women and girls with disabilities affected by conflict-related sexual violence. It takes a long time to grow a field. So first you grow a field, and that means you build relationships. It's easier to grow relationships in your own sector. It's much harder to grow a field where all of those sectors come together. The biggest moment now is how to integrate all of these different sectors. So often what happens to women and it happens consistently in conflict with a vigor because it is the weapon of choice on the part of the combatants is viewed as collateral damage in a war. Yes, we've come a long way, but we surely have come very slowly uh, and we're still not there. So we need to look at how are these people and their community really impacted by this violence in the short and long term and what responses, justice, medical, legal, psychological responses can we manage to bring together and really offer people so they have a chance of healing. I was the first special representative on conflict-related sexual violence in 2010. And uh, to us, it was really about making sure that we set an agenda for ourselves. We do have more operational uh, support and, and, and help. We have more of support also to the, the survivors. And I think that we, we are listening to their voices more and, and more. When I started, I was almost the only one person. But now I see so many survival leaders and really leading that. I think for me, that is a really success. I think that a good survival-centered approach is when survivors, first of all, are seen as key stakeholder in the work that you do in preventing um, sexual violence but also really acknowledging survival can have agency, you know, and decide on the priority that we need. <laughs>